Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this, the 16th meeting of the Welfare Reform Committee in 2014. Could everyone please make sure that their mobile phones are either uh, on and electronic devices are either switched off or at least on airplane mode. Um, just before we go to agenda item one, I'll point out that Linda Fabiani has sent her apologies for today and for the, the next few weeks. Um, I don't know how long it will uh, be that, that um, she'll have to uh, miss meetings, but she has been replaced this morning and during the period that she'll not be available by her colleague, Kenneth Gibson, MSP. So welcome to the committee, uh, Kenneth. Thank you, Peggy. <laughs> okay, so we go to agenda item one. Uh, the first item of business today is a decision on whether to take item three in private. Um, item three is a consideration of the evidence received on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. The members agree? Yep. Okay, that's agreed. And that brings us to our second item of business today. Uh, it's the final evidence sessions on the Welfare Fund Scotland Bill. This week we are taking evidence from the Scottish Public Service Ombudsman. <coughs> the Office of the Social Fund Commissioner in Northern Ireland and the Minister for Housing and Welfare, Margaret Burgess. I welcome our first panel this morning, which consists of Karim Jit Singh, who is the Social Fund Commissioner for Northern Ireland, Jim Martin, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman, Nicky McLean, the Director at the SPSO, and Paul McFadden, Head of Complaint Standards at the SPSO. Welcome to you all. I don't think any of you have indicated you want to make any opening statements, but I'll open up the, the discussion, if you don't mind, by going to your paper, uh, Mr Martin. The first paragraph, you point out that this, this bill is proposing to give the SPSO not simply a new area of jurisdiction, but also a new function, uh, that of reviewing decisions. Do you want to give us an idea of just what type of change that's going to involve from your perspective? The, the, the kind of cases which will come through from... Uh, the Social Welfare Fund will differ from the standard uh, complaints that we currently see. In this case, we'll be looking at decisions which require uh, a decision to be made, uh, particularly for some vulnerable people. It will require to ma be made very quickly. The standard work that we do involves bodies under our jurisdiction going through a complaints process, the work coming to us, and there being an investigation process thereafter. This will require us to work in a different way. The cases we'll, we'll need to look at, we'll need to look at whether um, the local authorities have handled them properly, whether the decision was correct, and whether uh, we should put another decision in place and that decision be binding. So the, the kind of skills which will be required by my team will be different. The turnaround times will be different. Uh, and I think that the relationship with the local authorities and the need to get local authorities to give us information more quickly will be different. Um, one of the issues that we do have, as you've seen from the rest of the papers, is that it's difficult to plan for this because we don't have a clear idea of what the numbers coming through will be. That could mean that some of the people we currently have will have to take on this work. But if the numbers reach the volumes that the Scottish Government think they will, then what we would do within our office would be to create a special unit which would work, operate separately from the other work of the Ombudsman's Office and deal specifically and only with these cases so that we can get a fast turnaround, build up expertise and build up learning. So it's a, a, a different kind of work that would come. Okay. Another issue that you raised, and it's something that has uh, come up in the evidence that we've had prior to this morning, is that within the ambit of the bill is that the potential for a local authority who, for whatever reason, um, it may be you know, the, the cost factors or, or you know, in order to reduce costs, might outsource um, the, the processing of this, the Scottish Welfare Fund. Now, you've highlighted that this would have implications if you were to take responsibility for um, appeals. Just how would you manage to do that? I mean, it's, it's quite clear everyone understands your role when it comes to adjudicating on decisions made by a local authority, but if the local authority passes the responsibility for that administration to another agency, just how problematic would that be for you to, to address the, the role that you're going to be given? We would engage at the point at which the decision has been taken, and we would set out clearly the rules by which we would undertake these reviews that we would intend to do. In my view, 
people should not be disadvantaged in any way by any decision to outsource or not outsource any function. So we would expect local authorities uh, to ensure that we receive material in the timescales that we would set for them and that the review process would apply as if the decisions were being taken by the local authority. Our aim here would be in the review stage to ensure that the people who require a decision to be taken quickly get that decision taken as quickly as possible. Therefore, we require whoever has been involved in the first stage of decision making to ensure that we have the information we need as quickly as possible so we can arrive at that decision regardless of who they are. And you currently undertake uh, investigations into decisions made on behalf of a local authority by an agency at the, the present time? Yes. yes. And th that doesn't create any particular difficulties? No, it doesn't. Um, we have to be aware, and sometimes I think that the bodies under our jurisdiction, it's not just local authorities who, who use arm's length bodies, have to be aware too that because a function has been outsourced doesn't mean that the, the citizens who use their services should be disadvantaged in any way. Therefore, we would expect bodies under our jurisdiction to ensure that the complaints processes that these organisations use are the same as or better than the ones that the local authorities or other bodies would use themselves. OK, that seems pretty clear. Um, again, an area that you've highlighted in your paper, Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. Again, uh, rather than, than me ask a specific question on that, can you explain to us why you've had to include that in the paper? Why is that a consideration in respect to this? It's an issue which has been, a raised, around, been raised around this issue. And we've taken some legal advice on it. And the advice that, that we have is that it is likely that Article 6 uh, requirements are covered by the processes and procedures that we currently have in the Ombudsman's Office and would be by the processes that we're planning to put in place. But one of the provisions within Article 6 uh, is a provision that would enable hearings to be held if that were appropriate. And what we want to do is to make sure that when we put the, pr the processes and procedures in place for the re review system, that they are Article 6 compliant and therefore we don't have to waste time at some point in the future through judicial review or anywhere else of anyone testing whether they are compliant. So we've had discussions with the government, with the third sector, with lots of lawyers about making sure that whatever review process we put in place would be, as far as we can make it, Article 6 compliant. Okay, I'll open up to the rest of the committee to ask questions. I'll go to the uh, Deputy Convener first. Thank you, uh, Convener. Uh, my first question is uh, for the Source Fund uh, Commissioner, and thank you for uh, your paper. And uh, In your paper you say that your independent status is important in giving confidence to customers who have already received two agency decisions on their application which they are dissatisfied with. So, obviously, you perceive it to be the case that the people you work with uh, feel that because you're independent of the decision makers, that's important. Can you say why uh, that's your perspective? Um, well, that's based on um, my experience. Um, in, in 2012, uh, the Westminster Parliament passed the Welfare Reform Act, and that, as you, as you know, abolished uh, the social fund across Great Britain. And I was up until then, for three years, I was the social fund commissioner for both Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And certainly my experience during that period and my experience since, since then as a social fund commissioner for Northern Ireland is that when I engage with uh, community groups, when I engage with representatives of uh, applicants, that, um, and also when I look at the survey which we carry out every six months of the people who apply to my office and we ask them uh, what is it that, uh, about our office and they they very often mention words like impartiality and perceived independence. And I think at the, end of, at, the, uh, at the root of all this is that what is it that we're looking for in any uh, review process? I, I would suggest that what we're looking for, uh, or the citizen is looking for, timely decisions, high-quality decisions, and decisions which promote confidence. And I think what's important is that you actually have a process which is seen to be separate. I mean, one of the things I've found interesting looking at this material is that in the last complete year of the Great Britain Social Fund, which was 2011-2012, the, finan the financial year, there were 6,258 review cases that came to my office from Scotland in, in that particular year. The following year, we were, we were moving into a, an abolition situation. Uh, and I've noted with interest that, uh, and, and also, if I were to 
look at the figures for 2013 and 14 in Northern Ireland, my office has received 1,650 cases in approximate terms, you know, give or take four or five. So uh, when I look at that and I compare the number of cases that I, and I accept that you've got a different uh, interim welfare fund here, which is not uh, covering loans, and we had loans in, in the social fund, uh, nevertheless, you've got quite a significant difference in terms of numbers, and I appreciate you've clearly got some challenges, as the Ombudsman said, in terms of reviewing, uh, thinking about the number of cases you're likely to get in any process. So, sorry, a long-winded answer, but... but no, 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 not at all. I uh, appreciate it. So, uh, I've got two follow-up questions. First is, oh, clearly it's for this Parliament to legislate for how these matters affect Scotland, but would your recommendation be that in any second-tier review process it should be an independent organisation? Well, I, I have to declare an interest. I'm also a part-time ombudsman, and so I, I ought to sort of tell you that in Northern Ireland, as well as the Social Fund Commissioner. Uh, but but, but my, view, my view is that any review process uh, should be user-focused. And I think uh, certainly all the surveys, uh, and, and, and if you actually ask service users what they want, they obviously want to use a review process because they're dissatisfied with the initial decision. So the question from that is really, what is going to give them the most confidence? And I would suggest to you that it's likely that an independent process is more likely to give them confidence than one that necessarily rests within the same organisation. It may be a different part of it. I think a, a large part of this is about perceptions. And you, you talked there about the number of complaints you receive in your current capacity and complaints you received in your, your formal capacity with the, the role for Great Britain as well, but you did make the point there's a, a bit of a difference there because loans are involved. How, how many of the complaints pertained to uh, a request for a loan? Have you got that information? Um, oh, in terms of the, the, the Scottish cases? Um, and indeed in terms of the... Not well, kind of, I, I don't have those figures in, broken down in terms of loans and grants, but if I can quote from my Northern Ireland experience in the last year, in, in the Northern Ireland experience, I mean, just to give you sort of some blanket figures, we had just under 350,000 applications that were made for grants and loans to the Social Security Agency. This was first, first, first line. We then had just under 79,000 that went for internal review. And we then had... Of those, we had, uh, I'm sorry, there were 78,000 that were refused, and we then had 16,000, actually, that went for internal review. And then we had 1,650 that came to my office. Now, the breakdown there was that 1,406 of those were for community care grants. So only the remaining 220 or so were for loans. So it was skewed very much towards, towards grants. And I am very much aware that, obviously, both your interim welfare fund and indeed your um, proposed process is clearly going to be focusing on grants rather than loans. The uh, Ombudsman, uh, uh, convener, um, and uh, in uh, your paper, uh, Ms Martin, you say that your experience of the, uh, the system where council processes have uh, several, uh, multiple complaint stages is that this doesn't improve outcomes for uh, the people uh, going through uh, that process. Can you, you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, we, we were asked by Parliament to set up a um, simple and standardised complaints process for local authorities and uh, all other public service bodies in Scotland, um, which Paul McFadden has led. And the... Um, what we found is that in some local authority areas, um, you could have four, five, or even six in some cases, levels uh, of appeal uh, against decisions on initial complaints. And what we were finding in the old system was that a lot of people were dropping out, a lot of people couldn't find their way through the system, there was very little change happening in the complaint system. So we've introduced a new two-stage system into local authorities, which simplifies it, makes it standardised, and applies to all 32 local authorities in the same way. What we're finding there is that more people are, are prepared to see their complaints through uh, that process. The feedback we have from local authorities is that it is improving their contact with their customer base, with, with the people who are, are paying their council tax, with the people who they're providing services to. 
So all round, it appears to be improving that kind of service. So taking as many layers out as we possibly can and debureaucratizing these systems seems to enable people to get through the system quicker and also to improve the relationship between the body and the citizen. Speak of the, the necessity for an independent arbiter, uh, should that become necessary? I think the, uh, once you have the two-stage system, people can come to us and we are, we are independent of local authorities and health boards and others. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 the fact that the numbers coming to us are increasing year on year, I mean, I think this year we're looking at maybe 14% increase, or even on last year, which was up on the year before and stuff like that. I think people are, are increasingly aware of and making use of that independent route. I think Karamjit is correct. I mean, w w the people who come to us tend to say that they, they, that they, they are looking for that impartiality. I mean, Paul McFadden and I w w were involved in creating the Police Complaints Commission in Scotland, and in the first period of that body, the most consistent que question most consistently asked by people coming to us were, was, are you or have you ever been a police officer? So it was a, 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 people were really looking for independence there in, in the decision making. And one last question, uh, <coughs> convener in your paper, Mr. Martin, you also uh, say that under the uh, legislation we're uh, currently assessing that uh, for the Ombudsman this will be the first time you've been able to specifically review a decision and make a direct and binding change to that decision. And whilst that's unusual for you, uh, the Ombudsman rules proved a very flexible one and powers vary around the world. Such powers do exist elsewhere. Can you tell us a little about the international comparison? The, the standards for ombudsmen generally across the world is, is that people make recommendations. In some areas, uh, in, in some countries in the, within jurisdictions, the uh, ombudsman will take on simply, um, say, a local government complaint or a health complaint, which is about administration, but won't take on a health complaint, which is about clinical judgment. And in some cases, the powers differ, but also the impact of the powers differ. So that some of my international colleagues, when they make a decision, uh, that tends to, be, tends to be a recommendation. But in some cases, and I'm thinking of, of people in Australia in particular, they can, in certain circumstances, make binding decisions. Now, in the other work, the other side of the work that we do, I have always shied away from making binding decisions. Because I do believe that the recommendation process that we have there is working. This is a quite different kind of case that would be coming to us. It's about specific requests for specific sums under specific legislation. And I think at that point, it is important that the decision that's made is final and binding on that one. So it would be fair to say what has been proposed here isn't without precedent and is manageable? It is, it is certainly manageable. It is um, something which I would not want to be read across to the rest of our work because I think we've been quite clear to say that this is a separate area that we've been asked to, to look at and take on. And in this particular instance, I think that binding powers are appropriate. Thank you. OK, Ken McIntosh, we followed by Kevin. Uh, thanks, Arsene. And, uh, uh, Obviously, if I could just start with, with yourself. Just this, uh, the issue about um, uh, hearings and whether um, they're required to make uh, the new service Article 6 compliant, can you just expand on that? Um, because what you're suggesting is that you have provided the, the availability for um, complainants um, to have a hearing, but you don't expect them to be many. Um, who will make the decision? Do they have a right to a hearing, or is it your decision to d grant them a hearing, and how would that compare to other similar systems? What we, if, if the Parliament suggests, um, decides that this comes to the Ombudsman, then what we would... Uh, advocate we do at that point is publish after consultation rules and within these rules we'd set out um, the obligations that we would have, the time scales we would have, the process that we would use and within those there would be uh, an element which would allow people to request a hearing. The decision as to whether or not a hearing would, would take place would be one for me at that point and I can foresee circumstances where uh, it, it might be appropriate in order to, uh, to do that, in order to, to test evidence. But my understanding of the experience of the uh, IRS and, and the, the way that things are operating currently in Belfast, that, that hearings are few and far between when they're had. So what we're trying to do in this is to make provision 
to enable us to have the, the, the powers to investigate as appropriate when things come through, because we're putting a new system in place, so we need to make sure that we, we allow for all eventualities. Can I just check uh, with Mr Singh that the, is a hearing a right under the system currently as practised in Northern Ireland? Uh, no, it isn't. It, um, w we've, worked, we've worked on the basis um, in an ideal situation, you might want to see face-to-face -face contact between the applicant on every occasion and a member of staff. That isn't, pr obviously, that's not practical in terms of one's got to think of value for money as opposed to actually. So the question for us is, how do we ensure we have a high quality process in terms of getting the right information and taking the right decision? The way we tend to do that is by making sure we get the file from the agency so we see everything that's gone before. And we also then get one caseworker who deals with the entire case who will pick the telephone up and will actually have a telephone interview with the individual. And we send a record of that telephone interview out to the individual. Now, our, uh, we have a 12-day um, working, working, 12 working days uh, figure for f completing our cases. In 2013-14, we, we had an average of 6.7 days. So we've, we've clearly managed to reduce that quite, quite a lot. I think what's important here is if you want to give confidence to, to uh, people who are applying certainly to the social fund, and I would suggest your welfare fund, I think you've got to think about uh, uh, the, the background characteristics of the people who are applying. Many of them have multiple disadvantages. Poverty is certainly a key issue here, as well as clearly vulnerability. And therefore, you've got to think about having a system which is user-focused. And it seems to me that certainly what people want is a quick decision. And I think what's interesting for us is that when you compare the fact that we've had just over 1,650 cases in that, those 12 months where people have sought a review, in other words, they've asked us to look at the decision again, that compares with the fact that we only received five complaints about our service during the same year, and we received 81 other requests where people asked us to look at the case again. So, just to put that in context, so uh, again, the thing I would stress is that um, we haven't found the lack of hearings to be a problem. There is, in theory, in theory, the possibility of going to judicial review after our stage. Obviously. Roughly, uh, how many hearings per, you've got 1,600 complaints in a year, how many hearings? No, we've had no hearings. Sorry. No hearings at all? No, no, no. We've we've used the telephone. We, that's the point I'm making. But we we but we've not used have, hearings. But yeah. Did you have the you had the ability to go to hearing if you wanted to? No, no, no. We, we well, uh, we haven't anything in statute, but in theory, right. yes, we could we could arrange to go and see um, the individual uh, applicant. And the provision we do have, interestingly, is that we could make home visits if we felt that was appropriate. But we would only do that if we felt there was some serious. Uh, inaccuracies in, in what was being said and we needed to we need to make that visit. That tends not to be the way we, we undertake what we do. But we do think very seriously about how we can promote confidence on the part of the people who are applying and their representatives. So just Mr Martin, just to clarify then, is it your understanding that, that uh, accessibility to a hearing, access to a hearing has to be written into the legislation to make it compliant? And how, does you, how, how do you think it's going to work? Are, are you going to have these uh, telephone interviews? Is that how you intend to...? We intend, we intend to follow a lot of what, what's been happening in Belfast, and we've been to see what, what they do in Belfast and Birmingham. On the Article 6 thing, the, the issue has been raised with us, and what we want to try and do is to future-proof the processes that we put in. So putting enabling powers in there to have a hearing would um, certainly future-proof it, but I can also see circumstances where it might actually be useful to have two people in a room who have got two different versions of what happened and to test that out between them. You, just a quick point. You said uh, in one of your briefings that um, you, you, want, uh, you want the legislation, you want the ability to make rules in legislation, not, not just 
you know, you can drop rules anyway. You, you actually want it in the Act. Yeah. Why, why does it have to be in the Act? I think the uh, third sector bodies are very strong that this should be a, a part of the Act. It should be something that, that's a duty on me to do. Um, I, think, I think that's going to help build confidence in the system that that's there. I think it should, it should not simply just be for me to determine whether or not there are rules and whether or not the rules are published and what have you. I think it's very important that it's very transparent, it's very open, that everybody sees what the rules are and that whoever comes after me uh, has to be as committed to that as I am. Okay. Kavina, I had a couple of other questions. It's on different issues about complaints and appeals and so on, timelines, but maybe other... We'll, we'll go to other members, uh, Ken, in case they, they want to ask the questions. Or, uh, maybe save us having to uh, come back to you. But I'll go to Kevin. Thank you. Annabelle. Thank you, convener. Um, my question, uh, first of all, is for, for Mr. Martin. Um, uh, Mr. Martin and I have come across one another on a number of occasions because he appears in front of the local government committee at, uh, at least on an annual basis. I think it would be fair to say, Mr. Martin, um, that uh, there are a number of critics of the Ombudsman Service out there, uh, and I can imagine that some of them will be wondering why it is uh, that you feel that your service uh, can take on uh, additional workload. Um, could you give us uh, an idea uh, of how you uh, foresee uh, the service handling uh, this additional workload? Uh, you did talk some numbers earlier on, um, and you talked about flexibility of maybe setting up a, a standalone team. Uh, could you maybe give us an idea of how you foresee that happening? Well, convener, we can either have our annual spat now or we can have our annual spat in front of your committee um, in January. Local government I, I was going to suggest <laughs> that we do that. Um, just like any other public body, we have our critics. I'm sure this committee will have its critics once it comes to a decision on this because looking at the evidence you've had so far, it's quite polarised. And an ombudsman tends to deal with cases which are purely polarised. Therefore, there are critics on either side. But we can deal with that in January, and I look forward to that. The additional workload, I think what we've set out here, and it should, it should be clear, this, isn't, this is not a case of uh, the Ombudsman Office going looking for something. This is something that was, was brought to us, and we were asked that we would uh, set it, if it were to come to us, how we would do it. It is different work from what we do. It is additional. It will require some resourcing. My worry in this... And I, I agree very much with the, uh, the view of the Finance Committee on this, is that until we actually see the numbers which are coming through, it is going to be very, very difficult indeed to plan for what the resource base to, to handle this should be. So if, for example, the number um, of, of reviews requested falls below this 400 figure, which you know, has, is a reasonable low benchmark figure, if it falls below that, then setting up a separate unit within my office is not viable. It is not a good use of public money. It is not something that we would do. What we would do is we would try to look at using some of the resources we had, retraining people, getting people aligned with that. We will need some funding and some support to do that. But how much that would be, we'd have to wait and see. If we have something which is at the top end and the 2,000 number has been, has been used, and given the number which uh, Karamjit has mentioned for, for Northern Ireland being about 1650, it's not that wild a, a, an estimate, perhaps. Then at that, at that end, we would look at what do we need as a fixed cost on that? And Nicky McLean can answer any questions you've got on that, how we arrive at that. And then what do we need in terms of people in order to deal with that? What I would hope that this committee would do would be to support the Finance Committee position that this, this issue should be reviewed uh, six months into it, maybe too soon, certainly a year into it. I think we should have a review as to whether the funding that we have is adequate, too much, too little. And I, I agree with the Finance Committee uh, recommendation that in our 2016-17 submission to the corporate body, we should not only uh, show how many cases we've actually dealt with, but project forward what we are likely to deal with over the peers so that we can, we can work that out. It is something where I think we're just going to have to start it to find out what the actual impact is going to be. We can talk forever about what might happen, but once we see what actually happens on the ground, 
then I think we can, we can go ahead. But I can give the committee assurance it is not my intention to put in place anything that cannot be collapsible should the numbers not come. And that if I find I've got insufficient resource, then I will be talking to the corporate body and asking them to raise that with the government. Convener, I think that is extremely uh, useful indeed. Um, the Finance uh, Committee paper, which I think uh, is extremely um, useful um, in evidence that they, they have taken, um, it seems that, according to Argyll and Butte Council, um, uh, evidence that they gave and evidence that there came from civil servants, there were only 144 second-tier reviews in, in, in that first year. We all know that these things can change. Um, can I ask, uh, in terms of um, those, those second-tier reviews, um, are you uh, privy to any information there, Mr Martin, and, and how, uh, how long those processes took um, and, uh, and the costs of those reviews that were borne by local authorities at that time? The, I think uh, you, you've seen from the evidence you've got from local authorities that we have 32 councils, each of which are operating by and large in, in different ways to suit their own circumstances. You have the Minister next, I know that, and the Minister will, will undoubtedly have better information than I have. Um, the, the, the information that I have heard is that in the first quarter in Scotland this year there was probably around 75 second-tier reviews, which, if, if that is correct, would take you to you know, 300, 400 probably in the course of the year, so it looks at the bottom end. The costing element of that, I think that's a matter you have to ask the local authorities rather than me. Um, I, I see in some of the evidence you've had that, that some councils are, um, are, are quite clear about how much it's costing them, and others I don't see any numbers there. So you, you're probably in a far better position to get that number from local authorities than I am. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, Annabelle, followed by Kenneth. Uh, thank you, Convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Just a few questions picking up on, on what's gone before. Um, so to, to Mr Martin, I just wanted to ask, what do you anticipate as being the grounds for the second tier review at this stage in terms of discussions that have taken thus, place thus far? Paul McFadden has been working on this okay. initiative. I think um, Jim outlined earlier the existing role we have in relation to complaints, which actually covers the Social, uh, Scottish Welfare Fund complaints at the moment. So our current role would look at things around the maladministration of that. So, for example, whether um, Scottish Government guidance policy had been applied correctly, whether criteria had been applied in the way that the government had set out. And we can, you know, whether factual errors, errors had been made, whether decisions were made clearly. This new role gives us, um, essentially, well, the key difference is that we have a legal power to remake the decision um, about what to award based on the merits of, of that decision, that guidance. So, again... All of the things that we would look at at the moment in relation to complaints, so was the guidance applied correctly, were the criteria applied, applied correctly, was the decision explained clearly, these would all be um, still applied um, in addition to us looking at the dis discretionary decision that the, the local authority is making and, and looking at whether that decision was correct. That's helpful, thank you. I, I mean, I'm just thinking, particularly taking into account the discretionary nature of, of the fund, um, it, it, therefore begs the question how you could look at an appeal without you know, taking into consideration a key issue, which would be could any reasonable council have reached that decision or not reached that decision? And that tends to be a, a test that's used uh, quite often in areas of discretion in administration uh, in public life. And I, I'm just kind of trying to get at where the hearing need comes in because if you're looking at whether discretion has been properly exercised um I, I, you know the, the, the in page four of your submission you the, 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 the from the ombudsman's office talk about um uh, hearings for example would be necessary in circumstances where critical facts are in dispute but i i'm seeing further down the line taking into account in particular that there has been a first tier review within the council i, I would doubt to what extent at that second tier level critical facts would still be in dispute and therefore begging the question why why a hearing but perhaps if, this if i may if, if, if we take a, a practical example of where discretion may be used so each local authority may determine for itself um, the criteria it applies when looking at a case as to whether it's high medium or low priority 
and that may vary from, from council to council. You may also have councils who are taking decisions on relatively similar cases, but in a different financial position, given that in some cases the fund may be exhausted. In other cases, there may be funds there. And so one of the things that we will have to do is to look at not only each of the cases as they arise against the legislation, but where there is discretion for local authorities and others to apply their own judgment as to whether or not that judgment is reasonable and fair. And for example, if we get to a case where the, the, a case is, uh, uh, comes where the, the fund is exhausted, then I think the, the fact that the fund is exhausted and the local authority don't have money is probably more a, a discussion between local government and government than local government and the ombudsman. But one of the issues that might happen in, the, in these cases is that a decision is declined in a period when there were funds and that by the time the review has happened, the funds are exhausted. And at that point, we're going to get into pretty interesting territory. I mean, obviously, it's difficult at this stage. Yeah. I appreciate that to anticipate all circumstances, but I just felt it was important to make the point about dis the discretionary decision-making and appeals. But one of the things that I'm committed to doing is, is, if it is agreed that the SPSO should be the body that deals with this, is to engage with both the third sector and with local authorities about the practicalities of how this should be administered. Um, and, and picking up, and I will, I, I want to come to Mr Singh in a moment, and I know that he's keen to get in, but um, picking up on, on some uh, comments that he made just a moment ago, where, uh, I, I, if I understood it correctly, there is no formal provision for hearings within the system that he's in charge of in Northern Ireland. However, that would not preclude telephone conversations, home visits, uh, etc. where necessary. I just wonder, would that not be a, a possible approach for, uh, for the SPSO? Yes, as appropriate, yes. So there wouldn't necessarily need to be a, a procedure about Article 6 and formal hearings because it seems that in Northern Ireland they manage quite well without... I, th without I, think, I think the Article 6 thing is, 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 is growing to a greater significance than it possibly deserves. What we're trying to do here is, to take, is based on the legal advice we have had, is to try to put something in which would future-proof this process against challenge under Article 6. And so making the provision for the hearings, in our view, would do that. Although I do think it could be a useful tool to have in our toolkit. Could I maybe ask Mr Singh, I know that he had indicated he wanted to comment. I also have another question after he's, he's gone. Really, three points. If I could just take the last one first. I think the thing to remember about the social fund uh, legislation that we have in Northern Ireland, that's derived from legislation that the Westminster Parliament first passed through in 1988. So this was very much before Article 6 and, and issues like that were being... Uh, thought about. The legal advice that I received as Social Fund Commissioner some years ago was that actually if you looked at our review process and you looked at the fact that uh, in addition to that, that if anyone was dissatisfied with the external review process and the work that my office had done, that they could actually take, uh, take a judicial review application. And it was felt that those two issues combined uh, made us Article 6 compliant. That was uh, the advice we had. It was never tested in in court, but that was the advice that we had. So that was that, that issue. Just coming back to your, your other point, um, I, I think there are two, two issues here. One is that the word discretionary is really, uh, really referring to the fact that you've got a finite sum of money, and therefore you've got to take decisions looking at the individual circumstances of, of each case. Now, the work that my office does, and it's quite interesting, is that if you looked at the last year, 2013-14, 25% of the cases that we received, in other words, when we looked at them from the agency, we actually found fault in 25% of the decisions that were taken by the agency. Because the first thing that my inspectors will do uh, when they receive an application is that they will first ask themselves, has the decision-making process at the first line, and we also have an internal review process within the agency, has the law been interpreted correctly has the decision that's been arrived at followed the principles of natural justice? So that's the first step in the process. The next stage is that if we're satisfied that uh, that isn't the case, then we go on to the next stage. The next stage is to then look at and review the merits of the case at, at the beginning. So if we think that actually they've complied with the process, that actually it meets the guidance, then we won't uphold it. And, and just to say as an aside, that, that in that last year, we uh, overturned 36% of the cases that, that, that came to us. Uh, now, the second stage, 
when we look at the case is that we look at the merits of the case and the first question we ask ourselves is is there any new evidence are there any is there any change in the circumstances or it may well be that we may come to a view that actually the guidance has been misinterpreted and therefore we actually will take a decision which overturns that and finally in that respect um, we um, ensure that our decisions which are communicated are always a maximum of two sides they always have the decision at the top so that so that the actual applicant understands what decision is being made whether it's a positive or a negative one from their point of view but at the bottom of the letter because we send the same letter to the social security agency is that we will also say if, if we found error with their reasoning whether it's in for example they may not have uh, followed up they may not have asked the right questions so we would say there's an inquisitorial error, error. Or we may say it's a qualification area, error. They may not have actually interpreted, to interpreted the, the, the guidance uh, appropriately. So those are the, the things that we do. The final thing I think I just wanted to touch on was this question of uh, the, the budget, which uh, Jim Martin just touched on. Uh, it, it, it's interesting. If you look at how um, the DWP which was responsible for the social fund across Great Britain from 1988 until 2013. They used to uh, divide up the annual budget for the social fund amongst the 12 different regions in, in Great Britain. And, and, and here in Scotland, you, of course, had the offices in Springburn and in Venice. So you had two particular budgets here. And uh, I recall giving evidence to the Westminster Parliament's uh, Public Accounts Committee in 2011 when they looked at the community uh, care grants and the operation of them. And one of the points I made was that actually, depending on where you lived in different parts of Great Britain, you actually, in theory, with the same case, you could end up with a different resolution. And the question that then raised is clearly, well, is that, is that uh, appropriate? The second thing that raised is actually you saw different levels of complaints coming from different parts of Great Britain. So there are issues about uh, awareness of, of the review process. There are issues about uh, actually um, how the operation of the, the first-line decision-making is, is undertaken. But the one thing what was really interesting is that what the DWP tried to ensure across the 12 regions was to make sure that each of those regions were aware that their budgets had to carry them through the whole 12 months. So there was never any question of the budget uh, running out. But what it meant was that priorities, you had high, medium and low priorities, it meant that those priorities would alter during the year. And clearly, this was something which particularly third sector representatives and uh, applicants found very difficult to understand and appreciate. So there are a lot of issues here, which I think clearly, um, I, I would imagine to some extent with your 32 local authorities, you may have some similar issues emerging. Uh, thank you for, for that uh, background information. Um, in terms of the uh, uh, opportunity that there is uh, as far as your processes are concerned with this thing uh, for judicial review. It's not clear to me, has that, what is the instance of judicial review? Has, have there been none? Or you say that it's a rare occurrence, but it doesn't happen in practice. I just wonder, has it happened at all? Or what's the incident, incidence of I that? Think, I think the interesting thing is that, I mean, judicial review is going to be about process. It's not going to be about the original, it's not going to be about decision that's taken. It's about whether the process has been undertaken. And the experience of the social fund from 1988 until 2013 was that my office dealt with over 600,000 cases during that period. Uh, I'm the fourth social fund commissioner in that period. And um, to put it in context, in GB, you had something like 6 million plus applications, social fund applications, for frontline level. Against that background, you had 25 judicial review applications over those 25 years. And interestingly, Interestingly, 19 of those were in the first five years, and they were essentially what I would call um, testing the system. They were testing, for example, uh, are, are the social fund inspectors uh, interpreting the, the law correctly? Are the uh, social fund in inspectors actually demonstrating their uh, independence? appropriately so they were they were actually very much about so they were really ground setting ground setting uh, 
Uh, and, and actually what's really interesting is that we then moved to about six judicial reviews over a period of 20 years. So I think that uh, uh, you know, that may or may not be your experience in the future. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Kenneth. Thank you, uh, Mr. Martin, I want to follow on from, uh, in, in initially from what uh, uh, Kevin Stewart actually asked you, which is uh, he talked about um, uh, effectively the viability of uh, SPCO uh, being able to deal with the uh, second tier reviews and it was mentioned that it was perhaps 75 in the first quarter of this year. Now, uh, North Ayrshire Council, in their evidence, they said that um, if it was 400 reviews a year, that would not demonstrate value for money when compared to the cost of this service being provided by Scottish councils. And um, But if we go above 400, <coughs> or whatever the number is, I wonder if you can perhaps tell us what that number would be. The SPSO, according to the uh, financial memorandum, may have to physically expand their estate to accommodate the expected number of staff required to undertake reviews. So it seems that under 400 there's an issue about the, you know, the, the, the kind of uh, viability of the cost per review, but once you go up to a certain level, there is almost a diseconomy of scale because you then have to look at perhaps additional premises and resources in terms of staffing, etc. So where basically does this become a, a workable prospect and where does it not? I'm happy to take that one. Um, I think in terms of the information that was provided um, by local authorities um, in the original comparison undertaken by the Scottish Government um, in relation to tribunals, uh, local authorities and the SPSO, um, that information actually um, suggests that local um, government panel would be around, I think it was around £520 per case. Um, versus uh, tribunals at 420 and SPSO um, at 200, I think at the, that was at the 2000 figure. So I think that um, even at the lower end of the spectrum of 400 cases, um, obviously it's for um, yourselves to consider that, but I think the costs um, at the lower end would probably be relatively similar to um, the costs that are being provided by local authorities. Um, in terms of where, um, in terms of where uh, SPSO becomes viable. Um, I think that um, if, if numbers fell below the 400 level, what we would then need to consider is whether or not it was possible to absorb those cases within our current operation in some way so that rather than establishing a separate unit um, within the organisation, whether we could further absorb that work within the current structures and the current management systems. Um, to try to uh, reduce or, or, or keep costs to a minimum. Um, I, I think it's difficult to say where the, what, where the tipping point would be, um, but, I, but I think that you're talking about comparative costs at the moment in any event at the 400 level with the predictions that are being made by local authorities. And, and Sorry, can I just take the, the, yeah. the question you asked about accommodation? We are not free agents in this. We, we operate under the direction of the corporate body. And currently we are leasing out part of our office to the Scottish Human Rights Commission as a part of a shared services initiative to save cash, and it's working quite well. But the, the, the building has got physical constraints on it. Now, if we were to put another six, seven people in there, they just wouldn't fit in the building. So that then throws up an issue of, well, what happens here? Do we take some of our work into to our building and, and put some of the, the current ombudsman work somewhere else? Do we move to new premises with other people, all that kind of stuff? These are issues which I think the, the corporate body will need to gr grapple with because I think it's a bit bigger than just simply how could the ombudsman you know, find a place for four people? I think there, there are... There are there are better ways of doing it, smarter ways of doing it, and economies of scale to be had in that calculation. Well, yeah. The, scale well, the, the, the other thing that, that, that this is well flagging to this committee is that there are other discussions going on with uh, different parts of government about future, uh, other future uh, increases to our jurisdiction as ombudsman coming along, probably in roughly the same time scale as this, which may bring that to a head even before this issue arises. Okay. Now, how realistic is the possibility that you might get 2,000 cases when I mean, you've talked about 75 already in this quarter? I mean, that doesn't seem as if there's any likelihood that, you know, that there's, that there's going to be this huge upsurge um, to reach anything like 2,000 cases. So where's the analysis that that's a, a, a potential figure? This is, this is the thing that's, that's 
um, been baffling most of us. We've, we've been trying to get our heads around this for a few months, and, and you've got the minister, I know, coming next, and I'm sure that with, with all the, the backup the minister has, she, she will give you a better answer than I do. I can. What we decided to do when, when this was first mooted to us was, was to go to Birmingham before Birmingham was, was a, abolished. And at that point, as, as Karamjit Singh has said, there were around 6,200 Scottish complaints a year. So we thought at that stage we were probably looking at around 6,000 cases coming. We then went to Belfast and had a look there because that's roughly similar, although smaller than us, and we saw about 1,600. And that kind of makes the figure of 2,000 viable. But I think what, what we've, the mistake that's been made in all of this, not mistake, that's wrong, one of the things that's not been given sufficient weight in all of this has been that um, the solution which has been brought to the problems that people have under the Welfare Fund in Scotland have been approached differently by local authorities in Scotland. So there has been effective signposting of people. There has been pick up by other parts of local authorities and others which have alleviated some of the problems that people have. And what we don't know as yet, because the scheme is so young, we don't know how much of that will actually reduce the number of people who want to go through this process and come to us for review, or whether it's just that there's not enough signposting of, of the processes itself just now, and that, that in time that, that number will grow. Our experience has been, when we have taken new areas into jurisdiction, that we've seen an almost doubling of cases that come. So the, the best two examples, I think, are in prisoner complaints, where the numbers coming to us doubled, and I think in water complaints, where that is also the, also the case. It was also the case in 2005 when further and higher education was brought into the SPSO, but that was before my time. So we may be looking at you know, a doubling of the numbers. We may look at more than that. We just don't know. It's not an exact science at this space, which is why I, I really, really urge the committee to build in as many reviews as possible in the first couple of years to make sure that we don't build a big edifice for insufficient people or that we don't put enough resources in to give people the fast turn around they need. Yeah, I, I, I think that um, uh, Jim Martin made a really important point that obviously what you've, you've clearly got here is in, in your local authorities is that they may well be signposting people to other activities. I mean, I think the important thing, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that in terms of any review process, particularly an independent review process, you not only want to deal with the individual cases for those customers, for those applicants, uh, as quickly as possible, but you also want to evaluate what's going on and learn the lessons. And actually, in, in a sense, what you want is, th is the organisations who are taking the decisions the first time, you want them to get it right first time. And actually, you want them to learn the lessons from the process. It's not about the question at the end of the day of actually how many, nu how many numbers you get coming through. It's actually, and, and that, that is relevant, of course it's relevant, to the viability of any, any review process. But the ultimate aim has got to be, surely, what are the lessons you learn from this and how can the service providers, the original service providers, in this case your local authorities, actually learn the lessons from that? I mean, one of the things I do in my annual report is that um, with the different offices of the Social Security Agency, I actually publish the data in terms of their decisions that we overturn. And I actually ha have meetings with regional directors and we discuss the issues that, that arise because at the end of the day, it's in everyone's interest that they learn the lessons and their decision-making actually becomes better. Um, Mr. Singh, um, you obviously talked about, you know, um, appeal going to some independent local authority being more palatable for those who are actually applying. I mean, does that make you think that be, that alone will cause a significant increase in the number of people who uh, put their case forward for review? And I'm just wondering, you talked about, if uh, I heard you correctly, some 36% um, of uh, cases actually being effectively upheld. Do you think this will cause a surge in, in cases? And how does, that, how does that figure relate to what local authorities... I mean, obviously, you can't you know, perhaps give exact figures because local authorities are everywhere. How does that compare to local authority uh, figures in terms of appeals being granted? Well, my difficulty is that, that um, I, I don't know too much about what, what's happening here in, in Scotland. All what I can talk to you about is my experience from a, a, a Great Britain perspective. And actually, you might be interested that from a Great Britain perspective, the figure was 42% of cases um, that my Birmingham office dealt with for the whole of Great Britain, uh, that we actually overturned the decisions in 42%. 
So in Belfast, which is the, the, the office that I, I, I still have responsibility for until the social fund is, is abolished in, 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 in the welfare reforms in Northern Ireland, um, you know, we, we've currently got 36%, but that 36% actually differs in terms of the different offices. You know, you will, in some offices, the proportion is lower. In other offices, the proportion is higher. So that raises questions about um, uh, consistency or lack of it in decision making. It, it must raise questions, I think, about, you know, how are people learning the lessons in terms of uh, applying uh, the legislation. I think that's also important. I think what's also important is that, you know, I go out and I have discussions with third sector bodies and I talk to them about their experiences uh, because their, their representatives will be assisting people making applications. And again, um, I think it's in everyone's interest if, if you get focused applications coming forward. Is this high level of uh, appeals being successful, encouraging more people to actually well, go forward with appeals, which might I, lead well, to a significant increase over a period of time? Well, may I kind of just bring you back to a figure that I quoted at the very beginning? That, that if you looked at Northern Ireland 2013 14, we had just under 350,000 applications that, w that went to the Social Security Agency, of which 41,000 were community care grants. It's in my evidence to you. 131,000 were uh, crisis loans and 161,000 were budgeting loans. Now, of those, just over 78,000 were refused, so the remaining were upheld. I think there's a question here that really, at the end of the day, uh, it hasn't been my experience that people who make these sorts of applications are doing them frivolously. Now, people may have a, a uh, they may have an incorrect sense of what they're entitled to in terms of the, the directions or whatever, uh, but certainly the overwhelming majority of applications are being made because people are in very difficult economic circumstances and people f feel that. That's, that's certainly been my experience and I've, I've been social fund commissioner for, certainly for Great Britain and Northern Ireland from December 2009. So the last you know, four plus years, five plus years, you know, I've, I, I, I've sort of seen, five, well, coming up to five years, that's the, the picture I have. Now, um, I think it's always the case, uh, it will inevitably be the case, that in any um, complaints process or any review process, there may well be a number of applications uh, which uh, have, have to be turned down because of conflicting evidence. But I don't think we should start on, on the work from the premise that actually people are simply making these applications because they are they, uh, putting it bluntly, are, are trying it on. I think most people... No. I think they're more likely to succeed, you know, the, you know, if, if they know other people who've succeeded, not that they're trying it on. It's just well, I, I, I think that. Fear of I, oh, I see. I'm, I see. I see where you're coming from. Well, I think that I, I, I think it's it's an interesting question whether the high levels of cases, which are which are um, the decisions where they're overturned, whether that encourages more people to to come forward. I think what what does encourage people, I think, to make an application, and where we get very positive feedback from people, is because of the way they, they feel they uh, are being treated during the review process. I mean, <laughs> what encourages me most is when we turn people down and we say, well, sorry, the, 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 you, 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 you know, the legislation doesn't allow us to, to make this grant, is where nevertheless people will respond to our surveys and say, although I didn't receive a grant, I still felt that the way I was treated and the, way, the fact that you listened to me. And I think that's actually important. I think the issue, I think, is not about acceding to every request. I think the issue is really how you deal with the application. I think that particularly with the frontline decision makers, and I come back to your people in your local authorities, I think what's going to be important is that uh, how you actually ensure that they respond positively, perhaps signpost it, because I think one of the issues here is that, is that you know, we, we, we all understand this. We're all operating in a, in a process where uh, public sector finances are under pressure. And the issue is actually how do we ensure that we get high quality decisions w using finite resources? And I think that's what the, obviously all of us have to, whether you're first line or whether you're an independent review process, you have to think about. I don't know if that's helpful to you. Yes, thank you. Excuse me.
Um, Ken, do you, do you have any cover? We're starting to go up against the clock now, but if you have any outstanding questions you indicated you wanted to ask earlier. Two issues, give me a brief okay. note. Uh, very briefly on timelines uh, to Mr Martin. Uh, Mr Singh's indicated that the deadline they worked within, I think it was 12 days, but they've got it down to seven. Uh, what sort of time scale are you working, going to work to, and is that something that you will consult on? Is it something that you expect the government to regulate on? I think it's something we'd consult on. I think the, 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 um, with great respect to my good friend here, the, the, the actual number is uh, calculated once all papers have been received in the case. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Yeah. So, sure, so you have to add another yeah. four or five days at yeah. the front end of that. Whereas when we calculate in, in our yeah. current work, we calculate from the, the data that arrives in our office, not, not the case. Our, our aim would be to set targets which, were, which would take us to at least the best practice that I see in Belfast and hopefully better. Whether we can achieve that will depend on volume, will depend on resource and all the other things that, that we've talked about. But there will be an initial period where we have to get people up to speed. You have to remember that the people who are operating the fund just now have been doing it for 25 years, tried and tr tested processes. They haven't been dealing with 32 local authorities. So in the first period, we need to feel our way. But we, we do have a record of setting pretty challenging resources. And we would consult not just with local authorities, but with the third sector and others as to what these timescales should be. i just check on that point very, very briefly. Are you trying to do so timorously... Uh, because, uh, again, as Mr Singh said earlier, you know, speedy decisions ensure effective, uh, robust confidence in the, in the process. Or do you want to do so to try to meet the crisis that the applicants are in in the first place? Both of these. Um, but the, the thing that we need to make sure that we get, get into this is, is that the quality of decision-making is right. Um, because it's driven we, more by that than by the... It's, it's not going to be a crisis process? We, no, no, we, we, we will have a, a process in place which will be designed to get to the right answer as quickly as we can because we recognise that the people who are bringing these things are, are people who are in need. Also, it may require local authorities to work slightly differently with us and I would hope to do as much electronically with le local authorities as we possibly can to get that four or five days at the front end reduced. And finally, the, uh, on, you've, you've currently got... Um, a process and systems in place to deal with complaints about local authorities handling um, applications. You're now going to have a new system, and as you flag up, you're going to have one system for dealing with complaints and another system for dealing with reviews of decisions, um, with different powers for your staff, uh, different powers of adjudication. Uh, who decides? It strikes me uh, the decision about whether to deal, whether to treat an application to the Ombudsman, whether to treat it as a review or as a complaint, seems to be entirely yours. Is that how you understand it? Mm. Uh, if you set up a separate unit, do you understand the separate unit will only deal with reviews or will it deal with reviews and complaints? Do you basically want to, to, to make sure that every single complaint or review is basically uh, examined for to be both, as it were, treated as both. I know you're against the clock convener, so I won't go through our whole process. Um, but we do currently have a process in place which enables us to get back to people very, very quickly um, as to whether or not the complaint they brought to us falls within our jurisdiction, is competent for us to look at whether we can achieve the outcome that they want. What we would do is that at the front end of our organisation, we would have people trained to look at these things to determine immediately something arrives with us either through the telephone through on, or on paper, whether something should go through the review process or the complaints process, or in some circumstances both. It's something we do all the time just now. So that element of it doesn't give me any you know, sleepless nights. That, that's not the bit that, that makes me worry about it. The bit that worries me about it is getting the right amount of resource in order to deliver the service. So you haven't got the powers to review decisions at the moment? No, but we've got different jurisdictions coming in. So that, so that for example... If you write to me uh, t today in a social care issue, for example, you know, we, we'd have to look at the social care element, the health element, and what have you, and we train our people to do that. So you've, if you said have a special unit, will that special unit deal with complaints and reviews? Or no, just they'll, reviews? They'll, they'll do the reviews. Just reviews, not the yeah. complaints. If it uh, turns out to be a complaint, because a complaint, as I understand it, has to be, if you've got a decision, you have to refer it to the local authority for their views on that, which, again, would add all sorts of time. You know, some, someone who's applying to review the decision because they don't they don't agree with it, wants a quick decision, they want their money. 
uh, a local authority wants the reviewing a, the, the reviewing the complaint when they come to us can be two separate things or they could be interrelated section 7 9 10 i think of my my, my uh, legislation says that someone who brings a complaint to me to, to be looked at either has to have gone through a complaints process or a review process and we're pretty confident that that enables us to move speedily on these things Yes, yeah, just like to pick up on an important point that uh, Mr. Martin mentioned even just a moment ago about uh, hoping to work electronically. I mean, I would hope that it's more than a hope, frankly, because if it's an appeal of a first tier decision, the documents there it should be uh, on email, it should be communicated immediately. So uh, you don't need four or five days, I would, would respectfully suggest you could impose a deadline of 24 hours. Uh, subject to exceptional circumstances of computers crashing or whatever, because we need to really focus nowadays on speeding things up. All these administrative processes with respect take far too long. Uh, and we, if there's a way to speed it up, I think we do the public a disservice if we don't actively examine how we do that. I agree. I wholeheartedly with that. And I, I hope a lot of people read the minutes of this meeting and, and see that written down. Yeah. yeah no, uh, uh, I just wanted to take up the point that Jim Martin made. We, we had an agreement with the DWP that, uh, because we were dealing with paper files, largely, that we would receive the files within four days. Our experience was that over 90% of the, the files came within those four days. If they went beyond 10 days, then the practice in my office was to write to the applicant and tell them that the file was still at the DWP. And we usually found that that had uh, expedited. I just wanted to make the point that Mr. Uh, if I may follow up, Ms. McIntosh uh, raised. Uh, uh, I notice you have crisis grants and community care grants, and I'm assuming that crisis grants are dealing with the very urgent cases. Now, the, 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 for us in the social fund, we have crisis loans where people seek expenses for food, food and fuel, and the targets that we set within our office are 24 hours in those cases. And I'm happy to say that in the 177 cases that we had during that year, we met all, all that target with all of them. So what we have in my office is a clear receiving process which distinguishes between on the ground of urgency so that we actually prioritise those cases. We are up against the clock, but I have to ask this question because I'm getting more and more confused by the, the answers and information I'm getting in relation to the estimations of the numbers involved. Um, there's been reference to the numbers that existed at, at Birmingham uh, under the old system. I think 6,000 was the figure that was used for the, the, the appeals. The figure for Northern Ireland that, that you've given in your documents around 1,600, 1,650, something like that. The indication we're getting so far from local authorities uh, would indicate something around four to five hundred if we go from one quarter and, and the figures remain reasonably stable. We could be talking about four to five hundred. And yet you've both said that a figure of two thousand doesn't appear to be, you know, too far away from the mark. But Northern Ireland's got a population of about a third of Scotland's but it's getting 1,650. The whole of the UK had 6,000. So how do we arrive at a figure where 2,000 is a reasonable estimation of the number that we're going to have? I think it's the, the laws coming after me that, that, that would be able to, to explain how, how we arrived at the, the actual number. But the 6,000 figure is the Scottish figure. Right. That's the number okay. of Scottish... Uh, Appeals that went within to the, the UK IRS. figure, right? Okay. So it was six thousand. We're now seeing around four hundred. We know the Northern Ireland number is sixteen fifty. So for planning purposes, we've had to come to numbers to think through. Well, what would the implications be if we got to certain numbers? What the actual numbers will turn out to be at the moment, I think, is anyone's guess. Which is why I've, I think I've said three or four times. I think building in review of this is going to be very, very important. Yeah. yeah. Just to say that, that for the last complete year of the Birmingham office, which covered all the case, all, the, all of Great Britain, we had just over 48,000 cases for the whole of Great Britain, of which 6,250 were from Scotland. Yeah. Well, that's helpful in clarifying exa exactly where the 6,000 figure comes yeah. from. But again, if it was under the old system around 6,000, if it is currently in Northern Ireland around about 1,600, and Northern Ireland has about a third of the population of Scotland, it's very difficult to see how you can extrapolate that to a figure of 
of 2000. But we have to be careful we don't take apples and pears because the, the local authority system in Scotland may well be directing people to routes that people weren't previously being directed to by the DWP. So there might be a better qualitative response happening in Scotland, which is lowering the numbers coming through. I don't know if that is the case. I suspect that it is, but I don't know what the impact that has on volume. And, and from a manager trying to think this through, as Nikki will have to do pretty soon, it is very, very difficult to plan for when we, we don't actually know what the numbers are going to be. Yeah, that's a helpful answer. Mr. Just, yeah. just to add, add to that, you shouldn't forget that this is now the 26th year that the Social Fund has been in operation in Northern Ireland. And what you're dealing with here is, of course, uh, an interim welfare fund that has been in for less than two years, as I understand it. So it, it's, I think it's a case of making sure we don't compare apples with oranges. That's always worth remembering. Okay. Yeah, that's a, okay. a good rule of thumb. <laughs> uh, on, on that point, then, can I thank you all very much for your contributions this morning? It certainly helped clarify a, a few points, but it's also raised some questions that we'll have to pursue elsewhere. But thanks very much. Thank you. I'll uh, suspend the meeting for 10 minutes or so till we get the change of witnesses.
And welcome back to our second panel, which includes uh, Margaret Burgess, Minister for Housing and Welfare, Stuart Fubister, Scottish Government Legal Director, and Callum Webster, the Bill Team Leader. Good morning to you all, and thanks very much for uh, coming in front of us. Um, can I start the ball rolling, Minister, by asking a question in relation to the report of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee? Um, they queried why it has been considered appropriate that Section 4.1 is framed as permissive, which allows the Scottish Minister to regulate to require local authority reviews, rather than requiring regulation, which will put the review process in place. So why was that decision made? I think we've, we've had a letter from the, um, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee asking us to respond by the 25th of this month, and, and we, we, we are currently preparing a response to them based on that. But in terms of the technical issues, I'll perhaps add Stuart to yeah, surely. Um, some of that. As we indicated in the, the letter that went to the Delegated Powers Committee, um, there are various ways to draft that produce effectively the same result. Um, the committee has expressed a wish to take a slightly different approach. I don't think on our preliminary analysis we would see difficulties with that. So I suspect we will be coming more into line with, with what the committee were looking for. Yeah, because they said that there's no good reason why there should not be a requirement to provide for the matter set out in subparagraphs A and B rather than this being discretionary. So you think that they were on the right track when they raised these kind of issues? Well, in the bill is basically to say regulations can create a right of review and can also say that not absolutely every decision is reviewable. And that's still the policy, but there are different ways of saying that. You can say on the face of the bill, there shall be a right to review every decision, except such as are stated in regulations, which is kind of the direction the committee, uh, the Delegated Powers Committee were pushing us towards. Yeah. Well, we have been in this sort of territory before when we've looked at other aspects of legislation in relation to the, the new uh, powers that's been given under the welfare changes. But again, the, the Delegated Powers uh, Committee have gone into the same issues that we did. And they have said that the regulations should be subject to the affirmative procedure unless there is uh, a good reason why the, that procedure would not be suitable. Are we going to have any subsequent legislation as affirmative or can you tell us what the good reasons are why they aren't going to be? As the Minister said, we, we haven't finalised our position uh, to respond to the committee yet. But I would be surprised if we see difficulties in moving to affirmative. Um, from the previous evidence we've taken, and again, especially in relation to the evidence that we heard this morning, Minister, um, there are some questions around the, the cost uh, of the, the SPSO uh, becoming the, the appeal um, body for the, the SWF. In their submission, the, the Scottish Public Sector Ombudsman said that other options were considered. Um, in relation to who could do, uh, could carry out those appeals other than the SPSO. Can you tell us what those other options were and why the SPSO was considered to be the most cost-effective one? Well, we looked at a number of options, uh, one being a, a complete new set-up tribunal system set-up, which was extremely costly uh, for, for the fund. We also looked at whether local authorities should provide the second-tier review service and the other option we looked at was the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman. And I think it was very clear, both from the committee early on and from what we had said as a government, that we would look for an uh, independent um, review. It had to be independent, uh, independent of government. And therefore, there was very little support for local authorities providing that service, other than out with local authorities themselves. And, and that, I think, came out to be even more costly than, than what we looked at in terms of the, the ombudsman. Um, the tribunal system, I think, was cost prohibitive to set up a full system simply to look at the Scottish Welfare Fund. And therefore, the, the Scottish Public Services ombudsman, who are used to looking at uh, dealing with local authorities, albeit that they deal with complaints at the moment, uh, in discussion with them, they, they, they said that they, you know, we felt they had the skills there as well and they were willing to take on the training to train their staff to look at reviewing uh, decisions of the Scottish Welfare Fund. And in terms of cost, it, it, it wasn't, it was, 
certainly cheaper than the tribunal and in our view cheapo, cheaper and a better option than local authorities which would not would not be perceived as being an independent review system which is something that we were we said from the outset and that was the one thing that was lacking from the interim fund was there was no independent review yeah some of the evidence that we've received has indicated that local authorities in particular but we did hear it from other sources as well concerns over the administrative cost of the, the, the the Scottish Welfare Fund. Some of those complaints are, are in opposition to one another, if you like. At the finan Finance Committee, when that, the, member, the financial memorandum was being scrutinised, some concerns were raised that £5 million was given as a cost for administering a fund which is £33 million in total. And some people thought that that was disproportionate. But local authorities and others have said that the current cost of administration um, is insufficient that the, the local authorities feel as though they haven't been provided with adequate resources to administer the fund, which would indicate that they believe that £5 million is too little to administer the £33 million. Do you have a view on either of those positions? I think at the outset we were clear that um, the £5 million was sufficient. That represents around 15% of the total fund, which is more than would normally be uh, in a pr procurement, and it's around 10% in administration costs, unless there's real complexities. We are aware that um, COSLA in particular have said that that is insufficient. Uh, the 15% is insufficient to administer the fund, and they are conducting a, a benchmarking exercise. And, and the Deputy First Minister has said that um, once the, the benchmarking is complete, and if there is compelling evidence that demonstrates that the fund cannot be administered uh, for the costs that, that we believe it can be, then that that's something that she would look at again, but not until that evidence is placed in front of us. And these are always discussions that have to take place between local authorities and the Scottish Government. I understand that, and you know we do our best to try and get to the bottom of it. But um, if there is this, at least an agreement that the figures are not agreed to then we have to wait and see how those discussions take place. But what came out in the evidence this morning is that some of the additional costs in terms of the, the new system that's being proposed under this bill is that the Scottish Public Services uh, Ombudsman would take on responsibility for an aspect of it. There are some questions about how much that will cost. There are some there is, uh, estimates which are being uh, you know, queried uh, about their... Um, accuracy. But ultimately the SPSO is not funded by local authorities, it's funded by the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body. If there are additional costs to the SPSO, what discussions have taken place between the Scottish Government and the SPCB uh, of the Scottish Parliament about the additional costs? There's been a number of discussions between the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament corporate body, and, and that's where we've based the, the assumptions of the planning assumption we've made uh, and how much that we will transfer for administration costs and also how much will be given to the corporate body um, to allow the SPSO to, to operate the system. As we, the, the, there's obviously cost to, to run the system over and above the cost of you know the, the reviews, the number of reviews that will take pace, place, but that discussion has taken place and we have had that discussion with the corporate body. Are the figures that have been discussed and agreed, uh, are they in the public domain? Can, has the, the information been made available to the committee to assess that? I'm not aware of that if it's gone to the Finance Committee, perhaps. The, the figures that, that mostly came from discussions with um, SPSO in advance of the bill being submitted were, they were in the financial memorandum um, that came along with the bill. So in as much as, as they're there, then yes, they be made public. We know where to look for them because I sit on the Finance Committee and there are other members around this mm -hmm. table sitting in the Finance Committee. That issue never came up in the discussions that we had. Um, but they have now, so I just want to know where we can look to see where those, mm -hmm. those figures are. Um, but I'll go to Jamie for questions and then Kevin. Thank you, uh, Convener. And, uh, notwithstanding Mr Fubister's point that the Scottish Government will look sympathetically at the request from the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee to use the affirmative rather than negative procedure. I'm just wondering how widespread a concern this is because I'm looking at the report of that committee. I don't see them particularly 
referring to much evidence they've gathered. I can't recall any of the witnesses that have come to us suggesting this is a burning issue. Has, has this been raised as a burning issue with the government by anyone other than the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee? No, it's only been raised by them and we've been asked to respond. We gave an initial response and we're going to complete a response as requested by the 25th of this month and we don't see any, uh, as was said by Stuart Fobisher, we don't see any uh, problems with what they're requesting and how we take it forward. OK, but the context is it's only them that's made the request. It's that's not this correct. committee, it's not anyone that's come to... No. Well, it's not this committee thus far, to be fair. We've not no, made a it report. Is, it's no only else. Okay. the delegated and okay. reform committee. Uh, uh, the convener uh, referred to uh, some members of this committee sitting in the finance committee. I'm one of them, and I know that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Webstone he came to give us evidence uh, in, at the finance committee in terms of the financial memorandum. He was very uh, helpful in pointing out what the specific uh, cost differentials between uh, the ombudsman uh, taking on second tier review as opposed to the tribunal service or some other uh, body. And I just wonder for the record if, if we could get that is set out again, because I know you, Minister, you've, you've set out there were considerable differences, but if we could maybe quantify them, that might be helpful. We could put, do you want to put it in writing or do you want to go through just what we've got in our papers? I mean, certainly we can send that information to the committee of where we arrive, but certainly um, we looked at it uh, in terms of the per case, if we're talking about per case. Okay, so yeah, that was, that was the, the context in which uh, it was provided to us before, and that would be be fine from my perspective, but it's per case, yes. Right, so per case, um, the Scottish Public Services, Ombudsman Services, came out at about, I think we reckon, based on this, the, the planning assumption of 2,000 cases, I think we have to say that we had to have a planning assumption to, to look at how we can take this forward, and it was based on in 2,000 cases, and the, the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman was in the two, £202 mark, um, whereas the others were... I think the tribunal was 413 with much, much higher set-up costs and also local authorities was up to anything between 420 to over £500 per case. So in terms of uh, looking at in that way, it certainly was cheaper with the Ombudsman Service. But I would like to say to the committee, it's not just the cost that we're looking at, it was about the integrity of the whole scheme to ensure that we had uh, an independent uh, review that the public uh, and the users of the service um, would have confidence in and also uh, the third sector and also local authorities when, once this beds in have confidence that we have a truly independent review process No I, I think yeah, that, that point's been well made, I think that's been um, well made by a number of uh, others who've given us evidence Minister, but notwithstanding that we obviously deal with financial realities and it does seem pretty clear that that's quite a substantial difference between what's being proposed in the bill and what the alternatives were, so that's helpful as well. One one final question, <coughs> if I may, Convener. Um, we had some uh, very compelling uh, evidence from uh, some uh, uh, individuals who have gone through the welfare fund process. Um, I think you could term them if it's not too patronising. as young people. Uh, they came to us, uh, I think, last week and I was very struck by the evidence they provided. A number of them were in contact with various uh, parts of uh, the local authority that related to them. And there was only two out of the uh, witnesses who provided evidence. There was two, two local authorities in question, uh, Glasgow and North Lanarkshire. I was very disappointed to hear that despite maybe contact with um, the housing department, despite contact with social services, uh, that they were able to tell us that they never were referred to the Scottish Welfare Fund or made aware of the Scottish Welfare Fund internally within the local authority uh, and were able to explore that with uh, COSLA because uh, uh, they were in, in a session after uh, uh, the, these people but and they gave a commitment that you know, this would uh, improve. I'm just wondering if the Scottish Government's aware of this as a, an issue. To be fair, it was only two local authorities uh, in question. Say, but is this an issue and is this something has been looked at and being improved upon? It's, it's certainly not been an issue that's been raised to me, and I spent a lot of time during the, the recess um, 
going round the, the local authorities and speaking to the welfare Scottish Welfare Fund teams, to the, those in the front line delivering the service, making the decisions. And certainly one of the things that came out from that was the, the better relationships they've built up with other departments of the local authority. But I think that the point that was made by the young people last week is not something that we would want to ignore. I think we have to look at that and ensure it's not just from the Scottish Welfare Fund to other departments of the council, but we maybe have to look at it working just as well from other housing and other parts of the council back to the Scottish Welfare Fund, that it's not just one direction. Uh, and I think that's something that I would be keen to look at. And like COSLA, we would want to see um, where, the, where it's not happening the way it should, then make sure it is going to happen. And it's certainly something we'll certainly take up with in the guidance and also in the practitioners group that regularly meets. And we fund, Scottish Government funds uh, an officer, a Scottish Welfare Fund officer, uh, who you know to coordinate between local authorities, and I certainly think that that's something we, we could look at because we, you know, when relationships are getting built up one way, we want to be absolutely sure they're getting it's it's happening in both directions. Thank you. That's very helpful, uh, Kevin. Then Kenneth. Thank you, Camilla. Um The finance committee had evidence uh, saying uh, that there were only 144 second tier reviews last year. The evidence came from our Guile and Butte Council and I think from uh, one of your own civil servants, Minister. And yet we have an assumption that there may be up to 2,000 cases uh, that go to the, the SPSO. Um, is the, are these assumptions made around the, the fact that many folk, once they've gone through first tier review at a local authority level, with the current system, with the second tier review going to local authority, do you think that these folks who may go to the ombudsman don't currently do it because they've done it through the council? They don't think they'll get any further the second time round. I certainly think that's that's perhaps one of the reasons that they feel that they've already, you know, asked for a first tier review through the local authority and then going back to that same uh, avenue um, for a, another review would perhaps not get the result they're looking for. That may be one of the reasons. But I also think the fact that, you know, once we have an independent review service, I would anticipate that we will see more uh, reviews coming forward. We'll also see, I think, third sector organisations assisting people to take a review forward uh, in, in areas. And I think that's for the good of the, the scheme. I think that would be useful as well. But we had to, and we looked at before within the when it was still under the, the system under the DWP, the social fund, the number of reviews in Scotland was over 6,000. So we had to, I mean, there's a huge difference between 144 and 6,000, absolutely accept that point. But we had to look at some planning assumption that was reasonable to, to base the costs on to take it forward. And that's why we came to the, the 2000 figure. But it wasn't just plucked out the air by the, the Scottish Government. It went through the reference committee, uh, which includes local authorities, COSLA, third sector and stakeholders. And they felt that that was a reasonable assumption to, to plan on. And that's why we've arrived at that figure. Thank you. We've, we've heard the numbers of 6,258 Scottish cases handled by Birmingham previously, 1,652 um, in uh, Northern Ireland. But of course, um, as some of the witnesses said earlier on, that can be comparing apples with oranges and the fact that because the system is administered by local authorities here, there's the ability to signpost people to other services if things are being done right. Um, so that assumption um, uh, has taken into account the, the, the different way that we are doing things here currently. And obviously, the review group has taken that into account as well. I mean, absolutely. And it is an assumption, and that will be reviewed again. Um, you know, we've got, before the, sun, the fund goes on to the permanent footing, that, and the SPSO are aware of that, that it's not just a, a tablet a stone figure, that there, it's going to be 2,000. If it seems it's going to be less than that, then the figure will re be reviewed down the way. The the ombudsman um, talked about uh, a con constant review after this has been established. Can I ask if that is uh, is in the government's plans? And beyond that, will you allow flexibility in case those numbers go up or or, or go down? Will there be that constant review? That that was the point I was trying to make. Just 
and, and obviously not very well a, a moment ago that it is an assumption that it can go up or down uh, according to what we see is happening within the scheme and how the decision making is taking place and the number of people because it's based on the number of people who will be turned down for the scheme that's where the reviews are going to come from so uh, yes that is a figure that will be reviewed and constantly reviewed by the Scottish Government and resourcing will follow absolutely thank you can I maybe turn uh, convener to uh, the additional evidence that we've received from, from COSLA, um, which members received this morning, which is uh, not particularly helpful, but I understand that the Minister Convener uh, has caught sight of, of that as well. And there, um, You said earlier, Minister, that um, you want to ensure that administration costs um, are, are fair uh, and uh, a, 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 a reasonable level. And I think, you know, where we have... Uh, a fund which is established to help those in the greatest need, it would be a great shame to see a large portion of that fund swallowed up by administration costs if, if that wasn't necessary. You've said that you think that 15% um, is a, a reasonable figure and above uh, what it would be under a normal procurement. Um, we, we have some evidence, well, a written piece of evidence from COSLA saying that um, under the old DWP system, uh, the percentage of administration on administration was much, much higher. Would that partly be down to the fact that under former DWP systems, um, a number of these uh, things were loans rather than grants, which are often much more costly to administer? Would that be fair to say? I think that would be part of the system because to administer a central system as the old uh, DWP system was and a loan system and collecting you know, the repayments and setting up all of that is more costly to administer. Uh, so I think that's very much part of why uh, the DWP system um, was at 20 per cent and we're not comparing like for like here. But also, you know, we, the Scottish Government topped up uh, by... £400,000, what we got from the DWP for local authorities to administer the system, we topped it up by uh, £400,000 for the first year. And local authorities made representation that that top-up could, should, could, should continue for the next year. And we did that. We, we listened to what they said. Um, so we actually topped up what we got from the DWP for administration costs to local authorities. Um, we have said clearly that once the benchmarking that they're doing comes in, if it is showing compelling evidence that it costs more to administer the scheme, the Deputy First Minister has said clearly she will she will look again. But it's clear that in, in this year there is no additional funding in this year, and she has made that clear to uh, COSLA. I, I, some of the, um, the the bits and pieces that is in the in the COSLA submission, um, some of the things that they're saying actually contradicts what we've heard in evidence. Uh, part uh, of the submission says that um, uh, it's much more costly um, for them to provide cash payments to customers um, and it says that uh, previously the DWP uh, were able to use post office accounts um, COSLA seemed to think that that's not possible and yet at the same time in evidence last week uh, we heard from some of our, our young witnesses then that uh, one of the things which they had difficulty with sometimes was getting to the post office um, to, to deal with the cheque or the, the voucher that they, they were getting. In terms of the benchmarking that COSLA um, are currently undertaking, um, have you had involvement yourself and input um, into that? Um, and uh, will you look very carefully um, at what they're saying? Because the experiences of individuals who have come here seem to be different um, from what COSLA have come up with thus far. Well, we're, we're waiting on the, you know, the COSLA's complete report, which they're going to send, uh, I think, in the first instance to, to the Deputy First Minister, and we will be looking at that very carefully. But we want to drill down behind some of these issues that you, you've mentioned there, uh, you know, in terms of the costs and paying out uh, loans in, in cash as opposed to 
to the DWP paying out in different ways. So we want to drill down behind that. And if there is compelling evidence that there is cost attached to that, then it's something we would consider. But we need to see that evidence. And so far, we haven't got that. OK, I think that's very, very, very useful in, indeed. Um, just my, my final point, um, convener, is round about um, best practice. Obviously, um, the cost at the, the COSLA uh, benchmarking will obviously find areas of good practice and probably areas of, of less good practice or even bad practice. How do we ensure, uh, Minister, that to maximise um, the amount of money that are, is going to those folk in need, how does the government ensure that best practice um, is exported right throughout the country to ensure that money is put to best use in helping poor folk? Well, we constantly look at best practice in terms of practitioners' meetings and where good practice is coming out. In terms of the officer we fund, the Scottish Welfare Fund, the Scottish officer in COSLA that the Scottish Government funds, and that's to look across the board to try and get this consistency that we're all looking for. Uh, and sharing that best practice, we also have the reference group that is constantly looking at where there is good practice and sharing that out. And I, I certainly found when I did my tour of, of um, welfare fund teams, that those in the front line have benefited a lot from that. And, and in the participation in those practitioners' meetings is really important to them because it's, it's a great uh, way of sharing experiences and learning about good practice and then taking it back to their own teams. And then we have the officer looking at that overall. So I think there is, I'm not saying we're, we're Every, we're where we should be yet, but that is continuing and it will continue. And we'll be looking at that in terms of when the benchmarking um, report comes into the Scottish Government, just how across the board it is and what variances that they are across the board and how they, they administer the fund and the costs. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Convener. Thank you. Mate, it's an issue of drilling down and uh, consistency I want to pursue with you, uh, Minister. In terms of drilling down, uh, as well as looking at best practice, you'll be looking at comparative costs between local authorities because as COSLA are talking about 20% across the board, but I would imagine some would be considerably less than that, some would even be more than that. But uh, uh, you, uh, in, in terms of the benchmarking exercise, you're going to be looking at these variabilities and variances to see why there, is, uh, there may be such uh, differences between local authorities? Well, we certainly will be, be looking at that, and that, that's what we're waiting in COSLA providing. And we're also looking at, as you say, it's, it may cost some local authorities more. They, they may have, they have a higher demand in their fund, that, that, uh, where there's a lower demand in a fund elsewhere. But currently, the agreement in terms of the administration costs and the, the, the funding for awards to each local authority area was agreed at the outset by based on historical uh, DWP um, applications in terms of the, the, the administration costs and uh, awards in terms of the, the funding that's there. Uh, well, as we move into the permanent fund, we, we would, in discussion with COSLA, about a more needs-based approach to it, and therefore that might spread the costs in, in a different way. But certainly we'll be looking across the board, and if there's huge discrepancies, with or without demands in the scheme, we'd be looking at the, the reasons for those discrepancies if they're absolutely something that you know you'd have to look at and say, well, wait a minute. Um, and we would have to look at that. And presumably, when COS, COSLA's doing their benchmarking, they'll be looking at that as well before they submit their final report to the, the government. OK, thanks. That's actually very helpful and leads on to the next point I'm making, which is taking administration out of the picture, looking at the actual award of funds. I mean, in terms of the Finance Committee, we took evidence to suggest that while some local authorities are under very severe pressure for this fund, <laughs> others aren't. Now, there's differentials in terms of the promotion within each local authority, so I don't know what the Scottish Government is doing to encourage a consistency of approach. But also within local authorities, some are being much more prescriptive in who they actually make awards to. And so you've got a postcode lottery whereby you might get a grant in Authority A, but you don't get a, a grant in Authority B. I mean, as a result of that, would you be looking for more consistency of the type of awards that are given? Or would you be looking to reallocate budgets if, for example, one local authority um, you know, had a, had a surplus at the, uh, the, towards the end of the year, but another local authority was under pressure? How do you make those judgments? Because it may be that one local authority has given out 
uh, it's maximum simply because it's 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 less generous. It, sorry, it's more generous in terms of the the groups that get it, whereas others might be only awarding to an, a narrow priority. How do you actually square those kind of circles? I think there's, there's a couple of things in what you say there. First thing is that um, local, you know, we expect local authorities to manage the budget, and that budget has been agreed uh, by, as I said, the historical means and the causal distribution group for the current scheme uh, as we're going ahead. And local authorities have to manage that budget by looking. So some will have to can only pay out in a high priority because there's a more strain in their budget. In another area, uh, they may be able to pay out in a medium priority or in some instances even a low priority when they define how they, they allocate the, their awards. So, um, And we anticipate that that's what local authorities will do. And that's why... Um, as I alluded to earlier, we, as we move forward into the permanent scheme, I think we have to look, but this has to be done in discussion with local authorities and with COSLA, we have to look at more a, a more needs-based approach to the funding that we have available. It's a finite amount of money across Scotland, and we want to make sure that those most in need get the money uh, that, that's available. So we have to work towards that. I mean, uh, you know, what, what Mr um, Karamjit Singh actually uh, said in the previous session of the Social Fund Commissioner of Northern Ireland was that you're actually getting inconsistencies in, within a, a, um, a, a local authority um, or potentially within a calendar year, you know, because of the way budgets have to be allocated, you know. So, for example, at the beginning of the year, um, they, they, you know, they may be more cautious towards the end of the year, they might be less cautious of the budget to use up. I mean, what, what, what can be done to try and... Um, allow a bit more flexibility because it seems to me that uh, you know some people are getting awards a because of where they live and b because of what time of year they apply for that exact same thing and i mean that's going to surely ultimately lead to more appeals and the costings we've talked about in terms of second tier reviews if there's if, if we can't iron out these consistencies I think there's, all, there's always going to be a difference between local authority areas. I mean, the scheme is a flexible scheme and it is discretionary and it allows local authorities the, the flexibility. When they're looking at their budgets, and I very much accept in the first year there was that element of caution, particularly you know, in the first six months of the scheme, where local authorities anticipated um, maybe a higher demand than they initially had, so they had more money to, to distribute at the end of the year. But as the scheme goes on, local authorities... We'll know the peak points in their area when they're liable to get increased uh, applications, and that may be around, you know, holiday seasons, Christmas, when there's real strain in family budgets, um, and and local authorities can work that out and and sort of plan their their year spend according to that. But there, even with the the the, the previous social fund. Um, the, the DWP social fund, there were always uh, some local authority areas whose budget you know, was used up and they couldn't pay out because there was no money in the budget and others that were differently. So I don't, I'm not going to say we're going to absolutely resolve that, but what I'm saying is that we can look at um, more a needs-based approach as we move forward with the scheme on a permanent basis uh, to, to reduce those inconsistencies. But I do think it's important that we do allow local authorities a, a level of uh, flexibility in, in their scheme. They know the issues in their area. They know, um, they start to know when the demand in their scheme is going to be high and the kind of awards that they're going to be making and, and where, the, the, you know, if there's a problem with, with sanctions in one area, a problem uh, if it's during when they still have in, in some parts of Scotland where during certain times of the year, you know, factories shut down, they t pay off um, temporary staff, that kind of thing. So they have to manage their budget to say, well, we may get a demand at these periods. So we have to look at And, and that's part of the, the flexibility of the scheme. OK, and just one final point, if I can, Convener. In the, in the Finance Committee report, it, we said, it's vital administration of the fund is supported by the appropriate resource levels and that growth and demand for assistance be recognised. Now, we know that the budget's been stable uh, over three years, but more and more people are getting to know about the fund and more and more people are going to apply for it, so pressure is going to increase. Uh, as pressure increases, all else being equal at the moment, uh, only more and more uh, serious cases are going to be awarded grants, uh, and again, that could lead to more appeals. Is there a, uh, what is the Scottish Government doing to look uh, at how this is being resourced over the long term, given these rising um, uh, demands? Well, as you'll be aware, um, 
that the Scottish Government can only plan to, to this spending review and how much that the fund uh, is going into the fund in this spending review. There will always be a finite, of money, a finite amount of money to spend on the Scottish Welfare Fund. Um, but some of the other preventative things that the government are doing will hopefully r reduce some of the demand in the fund. But we, like any government, we'd have to look at that. If the demand grows and grows and grows for the fund, then we have to look at how it's resourced. I think that just follows you know, any sort of any government looking at what the prior priorities are and if it's reducing inequality uh, and assisting those in poverty, then we'd have to look at the amount of money in the fund. But at the moment, it's been very clear, um, the finance sector has been very clear that what's been set aside for the fund till the, till the end of the spending review. But it's not something that, you know, it just stops there. We clearly have to look at it as it goes on to permanent footing. Will there be more uh, demand on the fund? Will more people review so that's more money getting paid out? And that's something that the government will be continually monitoring. OK, thank you. Thanks, Gideon. Uh, Ken and then Annabel. Uh, thank you, Gideon. Uh, thank you, Minister, for coming along. The, the, the government has made various statements at various stages about uh, its approach to welfare, about not just treating people with dignity and respect, but uh, rebuilding trust in the welfare system. Um, can I ask, is that an aim of this particular bill, or, or is it um, sort of more simply just a technical bill? I mean, I think the policy objective is stated as it is simply a bill to put the interim SWF arrangements on a statutory footing. That's the higher level um, aim of the bill. It's, it's the higher level stage, but the, the, the actual operation of it uh, and the guidance will come out in the statutory guidance and the regulations. So uh, the aim in, in the sort of high-level bit of the bill is, is, as you say, that 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 wasn't the aim. This was to um, v virtually mirror the Section 30 order, what the, sec the, the, the Section 30 order, and the, the bill itself mirrors what was said in the Section 30 order. And what we do in the regulations and the guidance is how it operates, which is about the areas you talked about is about dignity, it's about treating people in local communities um, with respect, ensuring that people are not destitute as best we can. So that, that's, that's what the teams out there are doing on a daily basis. I think the point I'm trying to get at is, do you see this as marking a different approach to welfare from that pursued by the UK government? Um, the UK government's welfare bills intend to treat people with dignity and respect. Is there something different here that we should be looking to that would mark a different approach to welfare. This is the Scottish Welfare Fund. This is specifically about the Scottish Welfare Fund, which replaced um, the, the social fund which the UK government um, abolished. They abolished the social fund. So if, you, if the question is, is it different than what's happening uh, south of the border because they don't have a national scheme like this, in some areas they don't have a scheme at all. So yes, it is about protecting vulnerable citizens and that's very much part of what the Scottish Government's about. So that, in terms of this bill alone, yes, this bill was introduced initially, the sec Section 30 order, to protect vulnerable people that weren't be protected elsewhere in the UK. In the, um, the government's expert group on welfare, there were a number of suggestions made, very, very welcome suggestions, I have to say, uh, including, for example, to empower people to take control of their own lives and to offer them choice in the way they receive benefits. Can I ask, um, has that influenced your approach uh, in terms of whether to offer people cash or awards in kind in this bill? No, I think we're very clear in this bill that it is up to local authorities how they administer the fund that they get. And while in some instances... Um, Cash is the solution, and, and I think the committee heard a lot of evidence uh, how much uh, goods are appreciated by those who uh, get uh, who make an application to the fund. Uh, and I, I would be honest and say I had reservations at the outset about goods and about other methods of payment. But after speaking to users of the fund and speaking to social fund teams, that in many, many instances that is a solution for people. But I would say that in terms of uh, crisis grants, the vast majority of crisis grants are paid out in cash uh, to meet that crisis at the time. And, and you know, we're very clear in the guidance and, and we'll be looking at this again in the guidance to ensure there is absolutely no stigmatisation of people uh, when local authorities, if they make a decision to pay out by a voucher, um, that there is no stigmatisation at all and that there's good reason for paying out by voucher. 
Um, but the vast majority are cash. In yes, terms but the of choice is ultimately grant. the local authorities. The choice is the local authorities whether to pay in cash. It's not uh, the government is not saying it should be in cash or saying it should be in kind. No. It's leaving it entirely. So you're not providing any guidance on that. The well, we have guidance in terms of the, the, the expectation in terms of crisis grants the, uh, will be cash payments unless but local authorities have the option to pay out in vouchers. And we're going to be we're consulting on the guidance, uh, the formal consultation on the guidance and the regulations will be taking place very shortly. And that's one of the areas that we'll be consulting on uh, when, when we're looking at that. Uh, we'll be looking at the... the number that are paid out currently uh, in vouchers, the reasons why uh, if they're paid out in vouchers, and also consulting with, again, those that use, this, that use the service and get the, the financial help from it. No, just to clarify that, so the regulations, we can expect the regulations to suggest that crisis payments should be cash. That's what the government regulations... Sorry, I, I didn't say that. I said the regulations uh, at the moment are... Local authorities have the discretion to pay in cash or vouchers. That is in the draft regulations. I'm correct in saying that. So you're not, you're not going to recommend cash? And we are be consulting on those draft regulations uh, and we'll be consulting on the guidance and when uh, payments should be made in cash or you know, the reasons why that payments in the most instances should be made in cash. And they are at the moment. That's fine. They are at the moment because it's local authorities' choice. Now, what I'm asking is, does the government have a view whether crisis payments should be made in cash or not? The government has a view that the crisis payments should be, way, be made in the way that suits the individual and the local, and the, when the local authority is administering the fund, as long as the individual is getting the best service and getting the, the help from the fund that they re require, then that is the view and that's why that flexibility is there. The best way possible, but not cash or vouchers. That's entirely up to local authorities. It's entirely up to... It's, up to local authorities to pay out uh, in kind or vouchers if they wish to do so. However, um, you know we, we've made it very clear that stigmatisation is an issue that has to be considered. Okay. Can we move on to another issue? Um, the old DWP system used to have a one-day deadline for turnaround. The interim arrangements on this new uh, welfare fund appear to have a two-day deadline, but we've heard quite uh, worrying evidence both from... Uh, recipients and from the voluntary sector that this is quite damaging. Uh, you know, if people are in crisis, they don't need a two-day turnaround. They need the money right there and then. Yep. I think uh, the majority of local authorities and teams work to a one-day deadline if all the information is there and the evidence suggests that I think 67, 68% of all applications are paid out on the same day. And I think absolutely right. If it's a crisis, then people should expect money ASAP um, and the majority are doing that there is not a presumption to work on a two day deadline the presumption is to get things done as quick as possible if all the information they require to make the decision is there and that's something I'm certainly willing to, to look at again I would be reluctant to force local authorities or to change it to, to make Local authorities make rush decisions on something. That, for example, if if, you, if we say it must be done in 24 hours, that there's a rush decision taken, and that perhaps it then ends up in a review. So we need to get the balance right. But I think we've got to be clear that decision should be made as soon as possible. If all the information's there, then the decision should be made on that day. There's, and and that's what I've been finding when I've been talking to the teams. Where I've found that decisions have taken longer is where another piece of information has been required and the applicant hasn't you know, been coming forward with it perhaps and that information's not there but the, the presumption is it should be same day in a crisis uh, Just to quote Connor last week who gave evidence uh, I totally agree with Lana who'd said it should be one day There is no way it takes 48 hours for them to make the decision I applied for a crisis grant which meant I was in crisis How could anyone expect me to wait 48 hours knowing that I was in crisis? Are you suggesting it's because the applicants aren't providing information? Well, I'm saying in most of the cases, when, when I spoke to the, the teams around the country, I mean, they were giving me examples of where they would have, they were knocking their socks off. I mean, people, 
Uh, and one thing about the Scottish Welfare Fund, those delivering the service now are much closer to the community they represent. They're really seeing the real issues that people are facing on a daily basis, where perhaps before they didn't have that kind of contact with people in their area. And they make every effort to pay out as soon as possible. I am um, willing to look at the, if there's evidence from the committee and the report from the committee and whether or not that should be reduced to the 24 hours. I'm not simply saying here today, no, we're saying 48 hours and it has to stick at that. If there's evidence suggesting that um, it would operate better without having rushed decisions going through, then I'm more than willing to look at that. Just to clarify, Minister, the DW you're saying that local authorities are closer to the community. The DWP had a 24-hour deadline. 24-hour deadline. Mm -hmm. It's the Scottish Government that's introduced a 48-hour deadline. Can I ask why you've actually increased the amount of time taken when you were supposed to be closer to the communities? What we did was we consulted widely uh, and initially on the, the, dra the, the um, guidance for the, the current scheme, the interim scheme. We consulted widely in that guidance with this committee and um, also with all our stakeholders and with users of the previous users of the DWP and that figure of 48 hours arrived. That was the kind of... Um, not the figure we're asking local authorities to work to, we're asking local authorities to process claims in a crisis as soon as possible. And yes, in most instances, it's done on the same day. And what I'm saying to you today is that we, we are still looking, we're still, when we're consulting on the guidance in this, this is something that we will look at as well. And also in terms of what we're saying, that if there is evidence to suggest that anybody's dragging their heels on this and stretching it to 48 hours when the decision can be taken in 24 hours, then I'm willing to look at that. I'll just put it the other way to Mr. Um, is there anything to suggest that the DWP managed to do this within 24 hours were rushing their decisions? Uh, no, what I would say is that in, in, from experience of the years that I worked uh, in a, helping people apply for crisis uh, loans with the DWP and budgeting loans with the DWP, very rarely, uh, in many occasions, the, the, it wasn't done within the 24 hours, and lots of the times it was simply that they, they didn't have the information, and it's not somebody deliberately not providing, there was something missing off the form, at least uh, been done by Scottish Welfare Fund teams. They're phoning, they're, get, they're trying to get the information, they are being proactive in many cases, they're being proactive to try and get that piece of information in, and that decision has been made. The DWP's 24-hour decision was once all the information was there. So, you know, uh, what, what I'm saying to you is sometimes a 24-hour day decision could take three weeks because the DWP said they didn't have all the information. And I'm simply saying that's not happening now, that we're trying to get those decisions reduced as quick as possible. And we're working to, and local authorities are working to a same-day deadline. Um, and that's what we're, we're going forward the 24 hours is the 48 hours was the the maximum we were looking at so you're suggesting that the scottish government with a 48 hour deadline is doing better than the dwp with a 24 hour deadline i th i think we are doing better uh, in getting the awards out there and getting them out to people i think going round and i'm i'm saying this a lot from personal experience in 20 odd years working in the advice sector and working with the dwp uh, i'm saying i think we are doing it better Thanks, Minister. I think we'll perhaps give you a follow-up to find out some statistics on how well the government is doing compared to the older DWP. Um, I'm not entirely sure that's backed up by the official figures. Can I ask, Minister, finally, um, why have you put in a clause suggesting you want to outsource this or privatise the service? That, that clause was put in um, in the basis that local authorities uh, in COSLA felt that it required that flexibility. Uh, at the time, uh, I, I was thought that would be, if outsourced, it would be outsourced to the third sector or a social enterprise, and that's, that's what we were um, you know, looking at on that basis. It's something that I know the committees, there's been a lot of, uh, engendered a lot of interest in this committee. I've looked at this again, and I'm looking uh, to see the stage one report on this, this matter.
but that was put in because it was felt it was a flexibility that was there, that there was a potential that could be outsourced. I, to the third sector is where I was assuming it would be outsourced to. I'm not assuming it's going to be outsourced to anywhere else. I'm not even assuming it is going to be outsourced. It was a protection that COSLA and local authorities wanted in there. It's not something that I'm precious about that has to remain there. It's just simply something I'm looking forward to, to the evidence. And I, I know I've followed the discussions on it throughout the committee. Okay. At the moment, it doesn't say uh, local authorities have the power to outsource it to the third sector or to share it with the public sector. It just says outsource it. So yeah. um, can I ask, can you take this opportunity to rule out privatisation and take this clause out? Um, I certainly do not envisage privatisation. I am certainly um, looking for the, the stage one report on this. I have no, uh, never envisaged that this would be, the Scottish Welfare Fund would be out to privatisation. It's not something I would envisage or look for. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, now, Alex. Hey, thank you, convener, uh, and good afternoon, Minister. Um, just picking up on a point Ken McIntosh raised, I'm just looking actually at the official report for our meeting on the 28th of October where we had a lot of young people who were users of the system and I have to say it was a fantastic evidence session. Mr McIntosh did actually ask um, one of them um, whether they thought that the, the, the new system was more supportive than the old system and, and the witness said that they thought the new system operated by local authorities was indeed more supportive than the one operated by the Department for Work and Pensions. On the subject of the 24 hour 48 hour, one of the issues that came up in the session last week was the desire uh, to have the possibility of a face-to-face -face interview. And obviously, when we get into that territory, that can impact on turnaround times and so on uh, 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 in terms of competing priorities. But I just wonder what um, facility there is at all for a face-to-face -face meeting for folk at the moment, uh, because obviously for some people, they feel much, much more comfortable. Yeah. Doing that. There, there's nothing uh, that prevents a face-to-face -face interview currently. I think, I know maybe one of my colleagues will, will correct me in this, but I think we said at the outset local authorities had to offer two methods of uh, receiving application forms. Uh, am I correct in saying that? And mm -hmm. some take telephone and online applications, uh, take applications from a third sector. There's nothing to prevent face-to-face, -face, but it could slow the process down uh, in terms of face-to-face. -face. What, uh, there's some evidence to show that the, the very most vulnerable are making their application with the assistance of another agency. So they're having the face-to-face -face interview with the other agency. But I am never, you're never going to hear me saying, I don't think MD should get a face-to-face -face interview. Uh, I always believe that if somebody, and if that's felt what is required, uh, a face-to-face -face interview, then you know, I think that option should be there. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's encouraging to hear. Uh, um, and, and a point you alluded to there was the fact that they may already have seen uh, another service in the council. And that brings me on to my second question, Kavina, which was an issue that was raised last week as well, which was that some of the, the witnesses felt that, you know, there was a, a um, first of all, none of them had found out about the, uh, the fund through the local authority involvement, none of them. And secondly, that for some of them at least, they're, they're, they already were involved with other departments in the local authority and that the information was not being passed on. They, they, they accepted that there would have to be a consent element to that, but nonetheless, if they consented, none of the information seemed to be passed on. It seemed that each department was working in isolation and there was no joined up working. Uh, and that then probably goes to cost as well in terms of administration if there were the sort of preventative, joined up, holistic working that we all hope to see, including, I'm sure, the local authorities, then that presumably would in turn reduce uh, administration costs. I mean, I, I, I don't know whether it would reduce administration costs. It, it probably may well do. But I think it goes back to the response I gave to, to a, a previous member that there is very good communication from the social work Scottish Welfare Fund teams to other departments of the council. But what I, I said I would do is look at and take to the practitioners group, is that coming back the other way from other departments of the council to the Scottish Welfare Fund? Because, it, I mean, it does seem nonsensical if somebody is in one department of the council 
and then they have to go elsewhere and find out about the Scottish Welfare Fund and then come back to the council to make that application. You're absolutely right, that doesn't make a lot of sense. So if there's something that's not happening that should be happening there, then certainly that's something we'll take to the practitioners group. I think that would be important because that in turn presumably would also assist in speeding up uh, uh, decision making in some cases because the council is already sitting on most of the information it needs. It just isn't getting from department A to department B. Um, and in that respect, going back to the, the COSLA paper that we received just before the committee started this morning, um, one of the points they make is in terms of, of the furniture um, provision, um, and they suggest that um, they're receiving reports of around 20% more staffing costs um, deployed, uh, resources deployed in dealing with the, this aspect of the fund in providing furniture um, in terms of, for example, uh, an example they give is uh, uh, resources needed to be deployed to manage suppliers' relationships. But I would have thought for many councils those relationships already exist with respect to other activities of the council. So again, maybe it's just a change in culture that's required that the council as, as one entity is, is involved in providing various services across the piece to, to, its, uh, to its citizens, but that, that these departments are very actively working together because if a, a large council has already got a managed supplier relationship, it would be difficult to see why such an increase in, in resources required simply to deal with some furniture provision under the, 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 the welfare fund. Yeah, I think two things I would say to that is, one, it's obviously up to the local authority to decide whether they want to, to use that uh, supply of goods or not. Um, and as the committee's heard from many people, that's, that's the way they, they want to get the, the goods from the, the Scottish Welfare Fund. But also, I think it's back to what I think I said to Mr Gibson about the drilling down behind the, the figures that COSLA have come up with. Is that across every local authority or has one local authority uh, came up with so saying it costs more to do this? And then looking behind it, well, why does it cost more to do it? when the council has probably been working with these organisations through social work department or other housing department for many years. So we need to look at that. Okay, thank you, Minister. Hey, Alex, and then a final question from Jamie. Thank you very much. Uh, excuse me, Minister, if I go over some things that we've discussed already, but there was a couple of points I wanted to make. Uh, the first thing is the, the issue of uh, local authority discretion. Now, I'm very supportive that that is in the bill, but the more uh, I look at it, the more I'm concerned that the, we need to know where the dividing line is between the virtue of diversity and the vice of inconsistency. Uh, are you confident that the structure put in place by the bill is strong enough to allow that diversity to take place without destabilising the scheme in terms of inconsistencies between lo one local authority and another? I do think that we can, we can, we can arrive at that uh, and that the bill is, is, is structured can get there because, but we do have to look, I mean, I, I absolutely appreciate that there's still a concern about consistency across local authority areas and that, that we have to look at that. Um, I do think uh, we are doing that through what we're doing in terms of the guidance and, and the regulations that we are trying to get this consistency. I, do, I also think that very much when the second tier review uh, is, if, is in place and is effective, then that will help with the consistency because there'll be good practice, there'll be decisions making there that are binding in a local authority that other local authorities will be looking at as well. And as I understand, the Ombudsman has laid out clearly that they'll be um, very transparent about how they conduct a review, what will happen at a review, and on that basis, and that will be all form part of the training and how we get a consistent approach across uh, local authority areas, but still allowing that bit of flexibility that they need uh, to operate the scheme effectively in their area. Mm. Kenneth Gibson, when he was asking his questions earlier, uh, went on to the issue of how uh, funds are divided between local authorities and how they may be divided in the future. Uh, how do you envisage changes taking place over time? And how do we avoid a situation where a local authority that perhaps manages its funds less well than another may then appeal for additional funds at the expense of one that managed its funds more appropriately? Can we be confident that that will not happen? Well, I think what, what, what I said earlier is that as we move into discussion with COSLA for the permanent scheme on a needs-based approach, 
that we'd look at that and it would you know, be a needs-based approach, but we'd also be looking at local authorities, how they actually apply that scheme. It's not, it's not going to be a kind of free-for-all, use up all your money in the first uh, two months of the scheme and then just apply to, to get money that, that's somewhere else. It will have to be done on a needs-based. We'll have to be, do it with discussion with COSLA, with local authorities, with social work teams and with other stakeholders to get a scheme that we're all confident will work, will be based in need and will not, will not be sort of just... And I don't think local authorities... My, my um, view on speaking to local authorities about this scheme, there's a real um, willingness to work for it and to make it work. And for those working in the front line, um, their input is critical in this because they're the ones that are dealing with it on a daily basis. And I think we can come to that agreement of how it will operate. And clearly, we'll be monitoring it as a government as well. And if anything is happening in this committee, I'm sure will also uh, be not be slow in telling us where something is going wrong if it does as we approach a needs-based mm -hmm. allocation. On another subject that was touched on just a few moments ago, uh, outsourcing, the, I wondered if the, the Minister would perhaps say a little about whether she sees outsourcing uh, of this responsibility is one of the ways in which local authorities, uh, for, for instance, smaller local authorities could pool resources across their boundaries uh, or uh, larger authorities perhaps that have a geographical or population synergy might work together. Uh, is that outsourcing one of the means by which you could see that happening? I, th I think there's provision, I'll perhaps pass this to Stuart uh, Fulbush, I think there is a provision in the bill for local authorities to... to work together uh, across boundary without the outsourcing part. Am I correct? Uh, well, there's a specific provision in Section 3 about yeah. two or more local authorities may yeah. make joint arrangements. So, yeah. 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 Outsourcing would be an option for uh, dealing with that. Would that be the case? More than one local authority could contract their areas jointly to a single uh, third sector organisation, for example. No, I think that's, uh, if I'm getting it right, the provision in the bill allows local authorities to work with another local authority to um, deliver the Scottish Welfare Fund to, with one of the local authorities being the lead. Is that... With a specific provision allowing a joint committee, but yeah. the, there, there is a the powers to make joint arrangements are quite wide. That, that provision's there. So the outsourcing... Um, I would look, look at that. Perhaps you want to comment on that. Does that provision allow for outsourcing, I think, is the question... Uh, to a third sector organisation? I think that outsourcing um, on a joint basis would be possible. So, yeah. Thank you. One final point, uh, and it's one of these strange things that often the, the thing that seems most superficial or trivial is the thing that actually causes the biggest problem to individuals. And one that we've had drawn to our attention on more than one occasion is the size of the application forms that people are being asked to uh, fill in. Do you envisage the change in legislation providing the opportunity to remove complexity from the application process? I'm certainly more than happy to look at the application process. I understand most applications are made online and are not being filled in by an individual sitting going through, but I appreciate that if somebody got a form, the number of paging is it can be quite daunting, so it might stop somebody even going through it. Uh, I know it's quite lengthy, but in most forms that people are not actually having to fill in every single part of it. There's only parts of it relevant to their application. But what I can say is that I'm willing, having heard the evidence from uh, some people having to use the form, is to look at that again. And if there's anything we can take out that form or simplify that form, then we'll certainly do that and we'll consult on that with, when we're consulting on the guidance. Thank you very much. OK, a final question from Jamie. Thank you. Uh, can we just uh, turn back to the uh, exchange I had with uh, Ken McIntosh, uh, Minister, and it's in relation to the 40-hour uh, the uh, target um, as opposed to the 24-hour target that the DWP operating. I just wanted to drill into something you said, because from what you said, it sounds to me it's fundamentally false to compare the two, and I just wanted to clarify, you were saying that under the DWP scheme, it was the case that essentially that 24-hour target only kicked in once they had all the available information they felt was necessary. Is that correct? That's correct. So, essentially, to compare that as a 24-hour target, because it, 
is, is meaningless if it takes a, a week for the 24 hour target to kick in or the 48 hour target that's that's that could be argued to be fundamentally false i think what i'm saying is it's about in, in any application to the dwp it's about that their time scales are based on when they have all the information uh, on the form when the form is completed filled in according to, to the way that it's, it's meant to be filled in. And they, in many instances, are not proactive in going to the applicant to get that information that's missing. Within the Scottish Welfare Fund, the teams are proactive if there is a piece of missing information. The teams are proactive and going out there to try and get that information either from the, the person making the application or from the third party organisation or another department of the council. So on that basis, um, the applications are getting dealt with. I think it was my view that the applications it, it is a better service to the individual. Okay, thank you. Okay, that concludes the questions from the, the, committee, the committee this morning. Can we, uh, Minister, uh, thanks very much for that. And obviously, we'll uh, now go away to look at our report and we'll look forward to your response to that. But um, both uh, yourself and your, um, uh, your uh, officers this morning have uh, been very helpful in, in trying to clarify some of the questions that we've given. So thanks very much for the evidence that you've, you've produced this morning for us. Thank you. And we now, as agreed earlier, go into private session with two or three issues that we need to, to deal with.